A friend asked me to make a video about um, ventilatory threshold, lactate threshold, fat max, um, how these guys interact and what they mean. Um, I hope it's a couple of weeks ago, so I hope I'm answering the question correctly, but I'm going to make an attempt to do this. So first I'm going to put up, uh, we're going to discuss the lactate threshold and ventilatory threshold a little bit. And... Uh, and then fat max. And so uh, there's always some confusion about these terms. Um, people kind of use them interchangeably. Um, and then they use different terms, meaning different things. Um, I'm going to use um, ventilatory threshold um, as uh, the ventilatory threshold one as uh, the anaerobic threshold, which is what uh, Wasserman and colleagues in 1973 paper kind of laid out. So that's how, how I'm defining anaerobic threshold. As you can see, even in, in the chart I put up here, this is actually from a new paper by Brooks. You have anaerobic threshold as threshold one, but you also have AT again with a question mark at threshold two because if people call the second one anaerobic threshold and the first one aerobic threshold, and it gets all messy. But anyway, so the first threshold, anaerobic threshold, as defined by Wasserman in this 1973 paper, the point where you basically have um, an increase, a nonlinear increase in ventilation. You have a dissociation between um, carbon dioxide production and oxygen consumption. And the idea behind ventilatory threshold by Wasserman, so this anaerobic threshold, was that as you start to generate lactate uh, and you became uh, more acidic, so you you would uh, generate pr uh, protons. You'd have to get rid of these via bicarbonate buffering, and this would then generate more CO2 that you had to get rid of. So you would alter CO2 production and ventilation. Makes sense. So I mean, there, there's there's a lot of problems with this. So I mean, he was ba Wasserman was arguing from was the, called the Pasteur effect that um, aerobosis, so basically availability of oxygen or not, is what's causing lactate production, which is wrong. Um, it's interesting. Because the guy who named Pasteur effect was a guy named Warburg. Um, and there's also the Warburg effect, which actually seems to be the correct thing. It's usually associated with cancer, but the idea of that glycolysis is aerobic. Uh, you guys can look that up. So it's funny that Warburg named the Pasteur effect when actually the Warburg effect seems to be the one that's actually the bioenergetic effect that seems to be happening in humans. That's a whole, whole side story. But uh, the, point, the point is uh, that that's what we're talking about when we say ventilatory threshold and that's why ventilatory threshold and lactate threshold should be similar as, as seen here right you get an increase in lactate at the point where ventilation change ventilation changing because of increased lactate um and now regardless of the the physiological validity of some of these claims um there is uh like say an organ organizational effect and, and these thresholds do seem to be fairly consistent. So between ventilatory threshold one and lactate threshold. Now I can uh, put up a, a graph here. Uh, so this, if we can take a look at this, this is kind of ventilatory threshold versus lactate threshold. Um, on the left, when the dump, bunch of different methods on how you can calculate the ventilatory threshold, you can do this with lactate threshold to lactate threshold. There's, there's a whole bunch of different ways you can calculate it, which in itself is a problem, but nonetheless, um, you do get consistency here. You get good correlations on the left side. See the correlations; they're pretty good. And uh, on the right side, uh, even the agreement. So the, in these kind of bland Altman plots, uh, the agreement is pretty good. Um, now, you know, you get some variation, like ten percent, ten percent plus. There's always some outliers, but all in all, there's pretty good agreement between the two. Now, if you're going single athletes and not statistical numbers. Um, an N of one, you always have to be careful <laughs> because something could have a really good correlation statistically, but if it's not for your athlete, you need to, you, you need to be aware of that. Okay. Um, nonetheless, uh, what, uh, how does the ventilatory threshold and lactate threshold, we're trying to say is, is fairly similar. How does that relate then to fat max? Um, and generally speaking, fat max, uh, is around ventilatory threshold one or below, or better said, at lactate threshold one or below. And the reason for this physiologically is that uh, lactate is actually a powerful kind of signaling molecule and has a, has a strong physiological effect 
on fat oxidation. Okay, and it does this in a in a in a kind of a two prong two pronged approach. For one thing is, and this has been known for a long time, in the '60s or something. There's some papers out there that uh, circulating a lactate will in basically reduce circulating free fatty acids. Okay, so if your lactate goes up, uh, your free fatty acid, uh, your circulating free fatty acids go down. So basically. Um, what's happening, the, 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 maybe let's say one, uh, one level deep mechanism as, as to why this is happening is that lactate uh, activates uh, hydroxy, hydroxycarboxylic, hydro, hydroxycarboxylic acid receptors. I never remember that, but it's HCAR1. That's how I remember it. So HCAR1. And HCAR1 um, inhibits lipolysis. So you're not breaking down any fat, so you're not going to circulate any free fatty acids. And lactate's doing this directly. So that's step one. You're not getting any free fatty acids circulating. It's hard to then uh, oxidize uh, fat. But it also, second effect is that this increase of glycolysis, you increase accumulation of acetyl coenzyme A, and that actually down-regulates beta-ketothiolase, um, which is uh, the rate-limiting factor uh, for beta oxidation in the mitochondria for for burning fat, it's kind of like PFK in in uh, in the glycolysis. So it's it's affecting circulating free fatty acids, but also then the actual uh, oxidation, the actual mitochondrial function uh, that's supposed to be burning this fat, and that's what that's what lactate does. And and the increased glycolysis, those things, which is related to to lactate, obviously. So this is kind of what happens. And uh, there's a study here, which is nice data from Brooks and San Milan, uh, where you see kind of fat oxidation as it changes with power output and uh, increasing blood lactate values. And you kind of get this decrease in fat oxidation with increase in uh, blood lactate, right? Okay. Um, so I, I hope that helps how those are related. Now, what this also means, though, is that if you are... You, if you're better at, um, let's say, recycling lactate, so utilizing lactate, producing lactate and utilizing it, and and lactate production is having a less effect on, on these mechanisms that are going to stop um, your fat oxidation, you're going to be able to have a, 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 a let's say, a, a, your fat max happening at a higher intensity and at potential ultra, even a bigger range of it happening. But you, you want maximum performance before these these lactate values start start increasing um, because the higher the performance the more overall power the more energy and the more of that is going to be able to come from from fat because it's not getting um, inhibited by by this lactate accumulation uh, what's important to note too on the the hcar receptors uh the hcar receptor one so um that's being activated by lactate is that's ph independent so it's nothing to do with with uh, with like protons or acid production or something. Which again, it's just just the lactate that's doing that as a, as a kind of a signaling molecule. I think this is important to know. Um, now, just because uh, I talk about nearest, what does this mean for nearest? So actually, I'm going to draw draw this into uh, into our little. Um, chart here with uh, with thresholds. So I'm going to draw in what a uh, nearest response would be to work rate increase, um, its relations to thresholds. And what we then see is that kind of uh, muscle oxygen breakpoint one is related to these lactate threshold one or ventilatory threshold and anaerobic threshold, um, which means the the time before you're hitting this 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 breakpoint one is where fat max is going to be it's going to be um, optimal. Now, it's hard to gauge exactly where that's going to be. Probably has a little bit to do with your fitness and what's happening, but it's going to be before before this threshold, um, for sure. And why why would muscle oxygenation even be related to this? And I think this is a really nice picture um, from a recent paper by Brooks, uh, where he talks about lactate as the basically the the bioenergic fulcrum. So it's lactate is what is mediating between glycolytic metabolism and oxidative metabolism. Um, 
anytime you have lactate production, it's going to be a mix, a mix of glycolysis and oxidative metabolism, keeping, keeping that going. And um, it's a whole series of papers on lactate shuttles on how um, lactate is, is mediates between oxidative fibers and um, non-oxidative fibers uh, to maintain energy, uh, energy production, energy flux. Uh, I think that's, I hope that helps people understand why SMO2 would then be related to ventilatory threshold one, lactate threshold one, and then uh, fat max. And I hope that it, there's some explaining here of, of those concepts um, and, and how they relate to one another. Um, thank you for listening. Bye.